Now we're going to hear from an extraordinary figure. Dr. Ben Abadi spent 20 years as a hands-on surgeon operating on thousands of human brains. And then in 2005, he decided to find out how he could, well, put brain surgeons out of business. Now he heads the Division of Neurosurgery at City of Hope, where he wants to put superhero tools in the hands of his colleagues and arm them, arm them with synthetic immunoreceptors to send those T cells on a mission to kill malignant cells, starting with that devastating glioblastoma you just saw. As for himself, he said his whole outlook on surgery changed after his father died of a brain tumor. Dr. Buddy. introduction. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you to call my wife and impress her a little bit with what I do. <laughs> Maybe later on. But uh, it's my privilege to be here and it's my privilege to actually work with a great group of scientists such as Christine Brown and, and pioneers like Dr. Foreman. I think he's sitting in the audience someplace. But uh, my job is uh, to go over the clinical results of the uh, CAR T cell therapy in the glioblastoma. And I cannot uh, do it without uh, telling you a story. Uh, and the story is about a surgeon, and the surgeon is not me. It's, it's about Richard. <laughs> so Richard uh, trained to be a doctor, and he trained to be a surgeon to help uh, children with uh, urinary tract uh, problems. About uh, three years ago, during, a, during the springtime, he was operating, and he had this uh, weird uh, feeling or an episode uh, which turned out to be a partial seizure. So he goes to the emergency room, he gets an MRI, and the MRI is negative. It, uh, and he was told that it was probably overexhaustion of uh, operating too much. Um, he goes back, uh, works for another month or so, he has another MRI. And this time, within a few months, uh, you know, there's a large mass in the temporal lobe, which you can see on, on the circle area. So Richard uh, gets cared by one of the best doctors in the US, uh, by his colleagues. They take out the tumor, and the tumor turns out to be glioblastoma. Glioblastomas are probably one of the worst, ooh, uh, I think uh, I only pressed it once. <laughs> okay, any questions about the talk? <laughs> Can you go back to the... Uh, Anyways, glioblastomas are uh, one, of, one of the most uh, devastating diseases that we can uh, have. Can you go back? Okay. I'm going to press it once. <laughs> Good. Uh, so they, they tend to be very invasive. So as a surgeon, when we go and remove the bulk of the tumor, we always leave uh, invasive cells that are at the margin. And it's these invasive cells that could cause problems and then cause the tumor to recur. They also invade normal tissue, they cause paralysis, they can cause uh, cognitive problems, memory, memory loss, and so forth. They also tend to be very uh, heterogeneous tumors. So if you look at this slide, you can see some areas are green, some areas are red. Um, if I come up with a target and destroy the red areas, the green areas will, will grow back within in a matter of a few months. Uh, so a single bullet uh, type of strategy is not going to work, unfortunately. And also because of the blood-brain barrier, some of the great drugs that we have that we can give systemically to the body do not penetrate the brain. And uh, while we see a lot of patients benefit from these drugs, unfortunately, unfortunately they have not really affected uh, uh, the prognosis of a patient with a glioblastoma. I'm, I'm so scared of pressing this now. <laughs> Can I go? OK, great. Next. So let's go back and look at our progress. What have we done in the past few decades for patients with glioblastoma? And to do that, uh, uh, let's look at some of the uh, other advancements in, let's say, technology. In the 80s, uh, I remember when I was a resident, we had these huge phones that we used to carry. <laughs> We paid a few thousand dollars for them, and they, the battery lasted like one hour. But that was good enough because you didn't have to drive off the freeway and answer your call. And uh, it actually helped uh, tremendously. And so, uh, so with the computers. Now we all have cell phones. I'm sure you, you guys are using them right now uh, to, uh, 
text or, or a tweet or so forth. <laughs> and uh, for, unfortunately for glioblastoma, we not need a lot of uh, strides. If you look at the bar, you see these uh, red bars. And those represent the average survival of a patient with glioblastoma. So when my own dad was diagnosed, uh, it was 2004, uh, he only had 12 months to live. And that's despite doing everything for him, uh, aggressive surgery, chemotherapy. So in a few decades, we've only added a few months uh, to, the, uh, to the prognosis. Now, when I came here, I, I came because I could see the vision of making a difference. Uh, and I saw a se sense of urgency and desperation, uh, which I hadn't felt before as, as a surgeon. Uh, so I came here with uh, Dr. Uh, Foreman's uh, vision and uh, uh, Mike Jensen, who, who was here before, to try to develop CAR T cells against glioblastomas. And we went through two trials. Uh, these are the old version CAR T cells. And although we did see some efficacy, it was not uh, uh, very dramatic. Uh, there were some local responses, but really nothing to make a huge impact on the patient's life. So then as I was getting a little bit uh, Discouraged, uh, Dr. Brown comes and says, Benham, I have a new CAR T cell for you. And about a year and a half ago, we submitted a protocol and it started uh, enrolling uh, patients. So I'd like to show you some of those uh, examples of patients that were treated. Um, this patient has a small tumor. Uh, you can see here in the... Uh, in this location, which grew rapidly in a matter of a few months. So she was one of our uh, early patients on the CAR T cell therapy. The tumor was removed, and uh, what we did, we placed the catheter in the, in the cavity. You can see the resection and the catheter. If we don't do anything else, uh, any other treatments, this tumor will come back uh, within a few weeks. And uh, for her, we enrolled her in the CAR T cell therapy. And uh, through the Alpha Clinic, she came and received uh, some of the injections into the system that you can see there. And uh, we gave her uh, the low-dose uh, CAR T cells. And after a month, we were surprised to see that there was, everything was stable. So we gave her another, another, another three injections. And again, everything looked great. There was no evidence of activity of tumor. And uh, we cut back on the steroids, the performance uh, status, which is the value of the function improved. And then uh, basically, we were done with the CAR T cells. Unfortunately, she came back. Uh, a month or two later, where the MRI looks stable, but there's some evidence of increased metabolism on the uh, PET image. So that suggested that there was some evidence of progression. Um, so I, I think that was uh, a great result, something you've never seen before. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, this issue of recurrence, you know, could be an opportunity. We could go back, we've collected samples from her, we can actually are in the process of analyzing to see how we can make the treatment better. But coming back uh, to Richard, you know, when, when he came to us, he had already had surgery uh, uh, in the temporal area. And then uh, he had, unfortunately, a few more tumors in his brain. So we offered him uh, the treatment. The tumor was resected. And uh, we placed a catheter and injected the uh, T cells in that area. And as we uh, saw in the previous patient, there was no evidence of tumor growth over, over uh, a few months. And that was great. Again, we were all encouraged, uh, but unfortunately, that was not the end of the story. When we looked at the rest of the brain, unfortunately, uh, Richard had other tumors. So uh, there was tumor in the frontal lobes now, and even in the uh, spinal area. So. Uh, it was impossible to go back and inject all those areas with CAR T cells. So we went to the FDA, asked them permission uh, to inject the cells into the ventricles, and it has never been attempted before. And all of us were nervous uh, about some of the toxicity. But Christine in her lab showed that it could be done, and it's feasible and it could be potentially very effective. So after getting some resources from the institution, we gave the next CAR T cells into the ventricles. And I remember the day uh, I was uh, in the operating room, uh, finished the surgery, went to my office in the evening, and I was really enthusiastic about looking at uh, Richard's MRI. And I clicked on the uh, first scan, which is the spinal MRI. And I opened it, and it looked normal. And I went back, and I, I know I clicked the wrong patient. 
So I went back and clicked the MRI again, and this showed up. And that is something I've never seen. You know, in the 20 years that I've been dealing with patients with brain tumors, I've never seen a tumor like this in the spinal cord disappear uh, with the biological therapy. And the, the story was also the case uh, with these other tumors. So all of these tumors uh, basically shrank, and you can see the curve here on the right side after intraventricular CAR T cells. And um, I still get moved when I, when I remember that moment. Uh, the first thing I did is uh, I looked at my father's picture on my wall in my office uh, with big mixed emotions. You know, we were happy that we eventually may be coming up with a great treatment, but I was uh, sad also that he was not here to see that uh, treatment. And then the next thing I did, I called Laura uh, Richard's uh, um, wife uh, and gave her the good news, and then I called Christine and, and we celebrated. So we've been uh, treating uh, patients, uh, we've done about uh, 15 or so patients, we've seen great local responses uh, in, in more than half of those patients. Uh, and uh, I'd like to show uh, another story uh, of Richard here. I was beginning an operation at the Children's Hospital where I work. I had a generalized seizure and the next thing I knew, I woke up in an intensive care unit at the University Hospital. I was diagnosed with a aggressive brain cancer uh, called glioblastoma multiforme. He came to us um, with recurrent glioblastoma, which is really an incurable disease. And not only did he have um, one side of recurrence, he actually had five tumors in his brain and a tumor in his spine. He was told by his oncologist that he had less than two months to live. T-cells are like soldiers of the immune system. They're white blood cells, and their normal job in the body is to eradicate unwanted cells. So the goal is to use the immune system and T-cells to help eradicate cancer. For brain cancer, we would extract out immune cells. And from there, we reprogram the T-cells that targets to the cancer that we want to eliminate. And then we grow these cells up to large numbers. And so what we're infusing back to the patient are large numbers of tumor-specific immune cells that are primed ready to act as soldiers, searching out those malignant cells, um, trying to kill and eliminate those cells. When we engineered these modified cells and put them into his tumor cavity, we gave him six infusions, and Dr. Badi uh, was very encouraged because where we put the cells, um, there was no tumor growing at that site. The glioblastomas are very, very, uh, very aggressive tumors. And even though if we can control them locally uh, in the area that we injected T-cells, they can still come back in different parts of the brain. The other tumors grew, and we were worried that it would have major symptoms. So we went to the FDA and asked them to give us permission to inject the T-cells right into the ventricles, which are chambers in the brain where the spinal fluid is made. So by doing that, uh, we hoped that the CAR T cells would get washed and delivered throughout the brain and also his spinal cord where he had many tumors. I think at that time even a lot of my colleagues were, were questioning whether we need to continue. And so it was a risk. It was a, something that's never been done. We had no idea it was going to work. I remember the exact day that I saw the images. And I clicked and I thought, no, this was probably the wrong patient. So I went back and, and then reclicked on his name again and brought the MRIs up. And I was surprised that, yes, in, you know, those tumors were not there anymore. I, I remember the day absolutely clearly. So Dr. Bidi called me. It was November 30th. Um, he said, Christine, you'll never believe it. Um, all his tumors are melting away. And the first thing I, I did is I, I sort of held my breath. And I told myself, wow, we may be, we actually have something very um, interesting, something that 
it's going to change uh, the way we deal with brain tumors. I think what's incredibly exciting about Rich Grady's response is it means that it's attainable. We can take a patient that has actively growing multifocal glioblastoma and we can see regression of all lesions, including in the spine. That's unheard of. T cells don't work for everybody. We're, st chill. we're still trying to figure out how to make it more effective. But we're seeing uh, people survive longer. For me, this is so important. It was this huge spark of hope and otherwise uh, pretty bleak moment. I, I find myself in disbelief in that I'm here. And it's a great thing. So, uh, as you noticed from at the end of the uh, uh, presentation, unfortunately Richard's uh, tumors have come back. He's actually back on the campus and we're trying to give him more T-cells combined with the checkpoint inhibitors, so combining immunotherapy. Uh, but through this journey, I think uh, we've learned so much. Uh, we have so much uh, tissue and sample that we're analyzing to help other patients. And it's uh, because of the group uh, of uh, patients who are experts in the area that this is possible. And through grant funding from CERM, FDA, and Gateway that we've been able to do this. But uh, uh, also uh, patients and their families. Um, without their commitment, without the determination, uh, especially the family members who sacrifice their time uh, and they bring their loved ones here uh, for the treatment. Uh, you know, this would not be possible. It takes a lot of courage and tenacity to do that. Um, and I want them to know that you're not just doing it for your loved one, you're doing it for others, for husbands of the future, uh, fathers and, and wives and so forth. Um, Laura, uh, Richard's wife is here, and I'd like her to stand up, and I'd like to give her a round of applause. I saw uh, Tammy here too. I don't know if Tammy's here, but I saw her. She's uh, one of our other patients' wife. Or maybe she. Oh, Tammy, right there. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you.